Okay, those on the, on the line are going to uh, start the meeting now. Hi, sorry I'm late. Traffic. You're just on time, John. Good evening. We'll call the meeting of the Cromwell Board of Education to order at 7.01 p.m. Alessandra, could you do roll call, please? He's on the phone. Mrs. Here. Mrs. Anderson, here. Here. Mr. Here. He might be late, but not here yet. Mrs. Here. Mrs. Post, here. Mrs. Ross, here. Thank you. Uh, to those that are on the phone, if you could just mute your line while you're not talking, we're getting some feedback. Thank you. All right, uh, approval of agenda, additions and deletions, and chair's review of agenda highlights. Um, so on tonight's agenda, we will have uh, some discussion on some policies. There'll be a robust discussion on the reopening um, plan, and uh, we'll be voting, or uh, potentially voting on the school calendar for next year. So there is just one change to the agenda. I would like to move up the reopening discussion to um, after superintendent's updates and before policies. Um, we're pleased to have Sal Neshi here from the uh, Cromwell Health Department. <clears throat> so we'd like to move that discussion up to the beginning of the meeting. So is there a motion to amend the agenda? Motion, motion by Catherine. Is there a second? second? Second by Lori. Any comments or questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries unanimously. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Someone. Motion by Selena, second. second by Jen. Comments, questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries unanimously. Okay, uh, celebrating our faculty staff, Dr. Macri. Good evening, everyone. Um, this evening we have uh, Ms. Cochiola here to uh, celebrate our Cromwell Middle School staff and students. And she's on her way up. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm very proud and pleased to present to you. This is Molly Sales, who's our CMS band director. And we're going to just give you a quick insight into what daily band practice looks like for our kids and how we had to adapt to, you know, keep our music program going and keep our kids safe at the same time. So this is Molly Sales. So I'm also honoring her as well for her, her commitment to think out of the box and to get the kids out there practicing. She had jazz band today after school and she was able to social distance them. So she's, again, working really hard to keep our kids um, musically included. Steve. Yep. Middle school. Please enjoy some rehearsal footage from today. <laughs>
So she basically, she said, you know, she thanked everyone for their support, but it's a, it's, you know, you can see also little snippets of what goes on behind the scenes as the kids are out there practicing. You can see kids out there having their mask breaks and we get deliveries. So, um, you know, they get to perform under the tent. So it's been, it's been a great experience and um, they're still out there. They're still out there. So that's why I wanted to celebrate them this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's dedication. Thank you, Ms. Cochilla. Uh, Cochilla. I try to f I'm trying to find the positive in everything, and the best part is coming to work and seeing our student back and forth and going to schools and coming back and seeing our students outside and waving to them, and they actually know who their superintendent is. It's pretty cool. There's, and I, I call them our, ta our talent, um, and they really do get so excited, and um, Molly does a phenomenal job with them, and it, it's just been talk about like taking uh, lemons and turning it into lemonade is exactly what she really has done with the program I do advise that if you come uh, to the Board of Ed or the middle school at all drive very slowly because there are children everywhere taking mass breaks and playing their instruments um, but uh, it's 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 pretty cool seeing and our kids are so happy <clears throat> thank you is that celebrating our students as well? Yes. Okay, great. <clears throat> Next, uh, correspondence. Um, we did receive one um, letter, and I didn't see it um, until now. It, I've been in meetings, as usual, nonstop all day long uh, from minute to minute. Um, however, we will be addressing um, a lot of these questions when uh, Mr. Neshi and Mrs. Hansen um, come to the podium so that we can talk about what happened at uh, Cromwell High School, um, why we needed to move into a hybrid model, um, the necessary precautions of what we have to take um, for HIPAA, and um, how much information we could release, and then um, the rumors fly anyway. <laughs> um, I've heard anything between uh, 200 to 300 students to 50 stu to 50 staff members being quarantined we don't we would not be able to run our school if we had 15 50 staff members quarantined so we'll tell you the um, the facts and um, we'll try and respond to as many questions as we have and I honestly believe that this is a discussion that should be had as an open discussion um, with all of you about um, what myself with what Mr. Neshi and what Ms. Hansen and Ms. Grandy we've been learning um, we are on three different calls every week um, with DPH and CSDE so everything keeps changing so um, the letter is in reference to the high school recently being forced into go going into high school uh, hybrid um, and then talking about um, social distancing and precautionary measures and I will have Misty Fury come up and talk about all that as well okay thank you uh, next on to public comment so as I mentioned at our last meeting we're trying to incorporate public comment back into our meetings and um, thanks to our tech team we've been able to you know hopefully uh, make this work uh, through zoom so there are four pe four people Steve well I have uh three are in out of the four okay okay um so can they hear us uh yes i believe each one can uh can you give me a thumbs up kelly if you can hear me yep okay <laughs> um so first up on the list of order is kelly so i'll, I'll unmute her for okay before oh, we unmute okay. anybody i just want to read the rules uh sure. for public comment for those that are um commenting and thank you for doing that uh it's been a while since we've uh had live public comment so I will uh, read the, the rules just as a reminder. <clears throat> we welcome and encourage public comments at our Board of Education meetings. To make sure that our meetings are conducted respectfully while encouraging public participation, following are the rules for public comment portions of our meetings. Thank you for your cooperation and participation. Individuals are welcome to address the Board of Education 
for up to three minutes each during the public comment portions of the meeting, but board members will not generally engage in dialogue. The Board of Education Chair may at his or her discretion extend the time for public comments. To facilitate efficient sharing of your comments, we encourage you to share any comments you may have about instruction, discipline, or learning materials first with your student's teacher, then principal, and followed by the superintendent before bringing the comments to the Board of Education. However, if you do not believe your comments have been addressed appropriately, or if you believe they should be shared with the Board of Education for any other reason, please feel free to do so. All com comments must not include personal attacks and comments cannot be discourteous, threatening, vulgar, or otherwise inappropriate. The, the board chairperson may at his or her discretion curtail any public comments or terminate any such individual's priv privilege of address at any time if they violate any of these rules, violate reasonable standards of decorum, are boisterous, or are repetitious. The Board of Education reserves the right to limit public comments to particular topics. So for each person, if you could just state your name uh, and address when uh, you are unmuted. So first is Kelly Wilson. Okay, Kelly, you can go ahead and unmute when you're ready. Hold on, Kelly, I can't hear you. One second. Um, hold on, hold on. Go ahead, one more time. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm Kelly Wilson. I'm at 18 Congress Drive here in Cromwell. Um, I thought I'd be brave and turn my video on because I could see you. So I thought I was going to, but I'm going to read from what I wrote because I'm nervous now. Um, so good evening. Um, as a member um, of the Cromwell Public School community, I wanted to um, have the opportunity during this Board of Ed meeting to share some ways that I have been educated through my interchanges with the superintendent um, in regards to my concerns um, since, June, since um, August <laughs> as to how the school district has been handling our, um, and how our children have been <clears throat> educated and socialized during this COVID-19 pandemic. So, um, so number one, I learned about the position the superintendent was placed in this summer to plan without much directives and support how our children will be educated. Uh, number two, um, I learned how the superintendent um, and the local health department representative collaborate daily to review health data to utilize in the decision making process as to how to plan for our children. Number three, I learned about the details um, included that contribute to how these decisions are made such as school sports management, how to provide appropriate PPE and cleaning products to staff and students, how to contact trace, who to quarantine once a positive COVID case is determined, providing substitute teachers for teachers um, whom are quarantined in addition to those who require a sick day. Again, all these decisions made with, with, um, with little to no directives from higher ranking authorities. And, um, you know, just in conclusion, uh, although the members of our school community have varying opinions, um, and despite what my opinion attached to the superintendent's decisions are, I felt it important to, um, to state that I believe the best efforts are being made to adhere to what I feel should be Cromwell Public Schools' common goal, and that is to provide a free, appropriate public education in a safe, environment, doing the best to decrease the spread of this extremely contagious virus and keep the infection rate in the schools from rising. Management of the infection rate, I believe, um, in the schools will undoubtedly affect the spread to the home environment and infection of vulnerable individuals. And um, so I, I just felt that that was important to share. And thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. Great. Thank you so much. We appreciate you taking the time. <clears throat> okay, next is, is, is Lisa, Ann. Lisa Ann Campbell. Lisa, if you can go ahead and can you hear me, Lisa? Thank you. Great. If you could just state your name and address, please. 
Sure. Uh, my name is, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Roseanne Campbell. I currently reside at 31 Valley Run Drive right here in Como. And um, <laughs> this is my first attendance, so I didn't write anything um, uh, in advance. But um, <laughs> I, uh, one thing that was um, a little bit disturbing to me um, when, when the children were um, all in remote learning um, is the method of capturing attendance um, that disturbed me a little bit. Um, right now, I don't know if, if other folks have this issue, but um, there are currently several absences on um, on the on record which are inaccurate, and I have spoken to specific teachers to address that. Um, some of them were addressed, but not all of them. And I just wanted to understand that how that will be addressed going forward, especially if um, we end up going back to remote in the future. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, and we won't address that specifically right now, but that may come up during the course of our discussion on the reopening. Um, or if, if it doesn't, uh, Dr. Macri or someone will, will get back to you. Thank you so much. And right. finally, I think Colleen. Is Rohan not on? Colleen, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Colleen Sokolowski, and I'm a resident of 61 Washington Road. I'd like to reiterate my thanks to Dr. Macri and the Board of Ed and Mr. Neshi, and especially all the employees of CPS for their very thorough planning that led to the successful reopening of our schools. I'm also the parent of a junior at CHS who was one of the students sent home to quarantine for two weeks. I read Adapt, Advance, Achieve, Connecticut Plan to Learn and Grow Together, the addendum, and their references to the guidance for from the Centers for Disease Control to understand how we are defining a close contact. I'm disappointed that we have not taken into account the strict adherence to mask usage that is taking place in our schools. Our teachers set high expectations that students would comply with mask requirements and they have all done so. In ignoring those mitigating effects of mask usage, we have caused our high school to revert to a hybrid learning model. Our hybrid learning model has a lot of downsides for our students and our teachers. The teachers are expected to split their attention and efforts between in-person and virtual learners. The block scheduling plan only allows for students to see their teachers in person once a week. And this past week, I've heard my students struggle to be included in in-person conversations taking place, in, taking place in the classroom, excuse me, despite the best efforts of our teachers. You know, a, a very specific example was her description of how difficult it was in AP Chem to have her teacher at home, kids in class, some at home, and having to organize breakout rooms and Google Meets between the kids in class and kids at home. It was mind boggling. And, and how can we expect to retain stellar educators like Dr. Spino when we're asking him to operate under those conditions? And by ignoring risk mitigation from masking, we've created some unintended consequences. Um, for example, I'm in the process of comparing my student's transcript and her current schedule to the course clusters in the CHS program of studies to determine the number of classes, the minimum number that she could participate in this year so as to limit her chances of being quarantined again, which I'm trying to balance with the outside in view of a college admissions officer so that she does not appear to be an unmotivated student and still be considered for a competitive college course of study. And this is not a calculation that a parent should have to consider. The classes that we would first consider to be dropped would be banded chorus. She loves those classes, but they're not worth the risk to stay in those classes and potentially be sent home again. An another unintended consequence that everyone should be aware of is that there were only two senior girls on the cross country team. Both were quarantined and had to miss their senior night. One senior parked at the end of Holly Hill and stood outside with her senior night poster and a school flag draped on her car because she was expressly not permitted on school grounds. And I wish I had a picture of that to share with you. The other senior wanted to do something similar but was already feeling punished by the quarantine restrictions and was afraid that there would be repercussions. There would have been no risk to our community if those students had permitted, been permitted to attend an outdoor event, socially distanced and masked. And, and just as a note, I have gotten permission from their parents to share those two examples. 
And I'm sure that we did not mean to create these situations, but you should be aware of them. So please, I would say in summary, consider the mitigating effects of our compliance with masking when our quarantine procedures. Please modify the quarantine procedures to allow for student participation in extracurriculars where social distancing and masking can be utilized. I would urge you to also push back on state policies that are overreaching in their impact on students. We have created a very safe environment in our schools and that is being ignored to the detriment of our teachers and our students. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Colleen. And I'm sure a lot of that will come up during the reopening discussion. Um, so is Rohan on? No. Uh... The only two other are Dr. Spino and uh, Katie uh, Shapiro. I don't know if they're there. Right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so they're on later. They are. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think that was a success. So, <laughs> so, <far. laughs> so thanks to the tech, name, tech team for putting that together. Much appreciated. And we'll have that going forward. <clears throat> okay. Um, report from the student representatives. We have our high school students on. Yes, we do. Um, our middle school students only join us for the first meeting of the month. But so, we do have our high school students on. Um, Hunter and Devin are both on. Great. Hunter, Devin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, for the general announcement, seniors will submit their senior portraits by November 2nd. The seniors also painted the shed on October 17th, and they were planning to take their senior picture as a class outside on that Monday. The, I don't remember what date it was. A small group of students volunteered at Trigger Trunk on October 17th. The World Language Club, National Society, and Student Council all put up trunks for the event. The World Language Club is signing up to go to a virtual Day of the Dead show on November 1st. Typically, they travel as a group to UConn for dinner and a show, but this year they're watching it from the comfort of their houses. Crumble High is preparing for Veterans Day celebration on November 11th. We would like to honor families of veterans with a display in the building. If you know it. Well, we will be talking about the updates, obviously, or, uh, around reopening. Um, we, I guess I can talk about something that, uh, sadly, we feel that we've put to the side and we, ha we really haven't. Um, our, our curriculum team um, is working just as hard um, to move forward with writing our curriculum. And Dr. McLean meets with the facilitators who are um, an exceptional bunch and very committed to not giving up on um, helping our students. And as you saw in the last meeting, um, the AP scores, our test scores were exceptional. We, as, we feel so consume, consumed by COVID that um, and, and our social emotional uh, stability for our students and our staff is absolutely our number one priority. However, we are not letting go of the curricular piece. Um, safety is absolutely always our first priority, um, but trying to have that balance uh, between what are our students supposed to be learning and how are we making sure that they are learning. Dr. McLean is constantly working um, with our facilitators. And when we get to talk about it um, and we get to talk about curriculum, it's really exciting because um, we're all sick of talking about COVID. Um, and so that has been happening. And we had our district leadership team. Um, unfortunately, I was unable to attend because I had a million other um, meetings at the same time related to COVID. Um, but uh, really talking about teacher evaluation and development and how we're going to improve um, the system. Uh, and it's not just about walking into classrooms and putting a check mark by teacher evaluation and saying, okay, it's done, but really providing feedback to teachers that's very concrete so that then they can improve their instruction. So we are moving forward. We are still a school system. We, you know, we take that very seriously. Um, and I, I think that's just something that we haven't really had a lot of time to talk to. So I just wanted to let everybody know. Um, and trying to think of what else I can talk to be literally uh, it's all about reopening <laughs> I don't usually have a problem with talking so I can talk on and on um I have had quite a few parents reach out so, I'm sorry Kathy we had a question for oh you. sure when oh. you asked the students about the mask wearing was and you had mentioned that 
you were disturbed that, to hear that students weren't married. Where did you, are you talking about one of our public comments? Yeah, the comment, I that, and then um, Wait, I one other situation. She didn't say that. Yeah, it, it was mass it's requirements was brought too. up. Mitigation. Yeah. Mitigation That's strategies awesome. were working. Oh, my understanding. Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, my understanding was the mass requirements. I thought I kind of I um, that I the mass it. requirements weren't being followed. No, they were. Was and what was what I understood. Oh, I'm sorry. And then I did have someone else approach me as well. So okay. it's not just one okay. situation. But, <laughs> so but that, was, that was why. And I'm sorry. I I must have misunderstood because that. I, I, I kind of heard what you heard, but okay. I, I, but now that makes sense. I right. Now yeah, I, I get, I get that it. was what I I was like. Oh, geez. No, no, no. Um, she, was, she was saying the mask. And because we we talk about that every single week of how are we in, <laughs> yeah. Do you in ask her? enforcing? <laughs> oh no, it's okay. Um, enforcing. Um, and then it, I did have someone else talk to me about it too. So I was um, just curious from the students' perspective at the high school at least. I, I um, asked some high school students. You know, I'm like uh, I you know. Same thing. We see, when I walk through the schools um, and when I talk to the administration, um, I see very good compliance. We are never, um, I, I'm not, Sorry. I won't say what I want to say. If, <laughs> but I'm going to say it anyway, actually. Um, if, if our students followed the rules while they were in school, as well when they weren't in school with us, then we would be in a really good situation. So to say, um, I feel strongly that um, what all of our teachers and our administration and what everyone is doing, um, we're, doing a, we're doing an unbelievable job um, with uh, the mitigation strategies. And I feel that strongly um, that the community, um, we, need, we need some true community support here so that we can keep our, our, our students in person. Um, and that's, that, uh, that that leads me to what I was about to say is my communication. Um, everyone's going to look at this pandemic differently. Everyone has their own, um, everyone has their own take on it. Um, for some, it's become very political and it's been very clear in my conversations with people. I have zero political stake in any of it. For me, it is about the safety and well-being of our students and our staff. And I will put that, um, as number one all the time. However, if there are uh, changes that we can make and revisions so that kids can have as normal of a life as possible, um, we're going to look at those and continue to look at those. Um, but we cannot do this alone. We cannot do this alone. Um, and Mr. Neshi will speak to you a little bit about the community spread um, and how we're approaching red um, and uh, the difference of what we're seeing in schools. However, that doesn't make uh, the 300 staff members here feel better <laughs> because um, it's you know they they don't know if they feel like it's only a matter of time that it could come into the school. So, with that being said, we can continue and then we'll bring that up with reopening um, because I would love to hear your all of your perspectives um, as well, and we'll show you the data. We are back live. Okay, apparently. great. So, sorry for that um, technical issue, but for those watching, we haven't advanced the agenda. We wanted to get that fixed, so it looks like it is working. <clears throat> okay, um, so next, on to the reopening plan update. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we're pleased to have Sal Neshi, Cromwell's health director, with us. Coordinator. <laughs> coordinator. I'm sorry. I know. It's I a little wrong, confusing, but he's our coordinator. <laughs> um, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Macri, and we'll let you and Sal run the discussion. Sure. Um, and we'll take questions after um, that. So, so, Sal, if you could just make sure that red light is on on the mic. Um, yes, it is. Sounds good. Thank you very much. So Great. I'll turn it over Thank to you. you. Yes. Thank you. So first, um, before we begin, I'd like to invite um, Nurse Pam Grandy and Nurse Jillian Hansen up as well because I feel uh, that Mr. Neshi will agree with me. Um, we are a team and we are a daily team. <laughs> uh, we probably talk to each other more than we talk to anybody else. Um, so in saying that, my first and foremost, um, we are incredibly lucky in Cromwell. Fortunate, blessed, whatever you want to call it. Um, Mr. Sal Neshi um, is incredibly available to us while he's trying to figure out 
uh, trace, contact trace, everything that's happening in the community. He's never not taken a phone call or not called us back within 30 seconds. Um, day, night, in the middle of it, it doesn't matter. Um, I have been lucky to work with Mr. Neshi in Middletown, and we have life we are lifelong friends. However, we actually it's it's pretty positive because if we don't agree on something, we have no problem fighting it out. Um, but his incredible knowledge, and if he doesn't know something, he's not afraid to go back and find the answers for us and get back to us. But he um, his his commitment to the town and to the students of Cromwell and to the staff of Cromwell. Um, has been unbelievable and I uh, can't thank him enough. I really cannot thank him enough. I, I am on superintendent calls today. I was, I'm on the HASA call, it's 50 superintendents. They don't have what I have. Um, and Cromwell doesn't, ha other towns do not have what Cromwell has. So I know it's t it takes a lot for the community to trust and they're going to ask questions and we are fine with uh, people asking questions. It's the questioning of the experts um, it, 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 it's a, it's, I, it's a, I don't want to say exhausting. It takes us away from everything else that we have to do in order to educate our students. Um, we're not putting things out there um, to make people upset or to keep our kids back from not coming to school or to hold them back from their activities. We're putting things out there that we can go to bed at night and say we have protected the community um, and our students and our staff to the best of our ability, ability without taking um, as much away as possible. What that looks like and what that means to other people varies from one end of the spectrum to the other. I, I had a conversation today with one parent who was like thinking I was absolutely crazy and I'm, I'm too strict to why are we in school? And that's from one end of the, one, and, and it happens all day, uh, every day. So there are facts, they change. Uh, addendum four is an example that, uh, and I sent it to the board. And then I also sent um, you something that was sent to us on our second DPH call today <laughs> um, with numbers and, and Mr. Neshi will uh, go through that. And also um, our two, our nursing supervisor, Jillian, he, this is our first year, uh, she tore over for PM Grandy, huge shoes to fill, 25 years. Um, she's doing a phenomenal job. Um, the contract, contact tracing portion and everything that we talked about and discussed with the situation at the high school inclu including nurse grandy um, i would say that we maybe slept four hours um the entire weekend this is this is a, it is a huge job it seems like it, it's nothing um a comment was made today that it was easy for me to just brush it off and say let's just quarantine everyone for 14 days that is not how it works um, at all. And we don't brush anything off. We do our very best. And I'm ex exceptionally proud that this is um, our team. And I believe that um, we're doing the very best we can. So uh, we'll take turns. Um, Mr. Neshi will share some data with you. And then you are free to ask him questions. Um, and um, I could let him take over um, if we could start with Whatever you want to start with, Mr. Neshi. Sure, thank you. Sure. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? All right, thank you. Um, so I'd like to preface any of my uh, remarks just by saying thank you for inviting me to be here tonight. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you firsthand whatever information I know in the spirit of transparency. Um, I do want to also say that in my many years, uh, 20 some odd years, 28 years, I think, 27 years of public health experience. Um, I have to say that I'm honored to be stuck in this pandemic with you all. Okay. <laughs> um, th this is an incredible, incredible team. Uh, the dedication flows out of all your pores. Uh, honored to work with the overarching uh, uh, reentry, I mean, re, uh, reopening committee that met all summer long. Principals uh, did incredible, incredible work to get the schools open. And uh, it was an honor, uh, it's an honor to work with you. The team that we have uh, with uh, Dr. Macri and Pam and Jillian, uh, we do speak multiple times a day, every day, seven days a week. Uh, no decision is made unilaterally. We work together. All uh, 
for the betterment, for the health and safety of our students and faculty and staff. Uh, I say on my, uh, on my regular unified command calls that we're in this together and together we're going to get through this. And I don't, uh, I, I, and, and, and I can't tell you how much I mean that. And, and uh, personally, from the heart, uh, I'm glad I'm in it with you all. Okay, and we're going to get through this. Uh, these are difficult times. These are new. Uh, it, it's a new era in our life. We haven't seen this sort of uh, virus attack the world. It's a global thing. So you can imagine. The equivalent of our board of boards of education throughout the world are, are dealing with the same issues. Um, so it's a new time in our life. But what's interesting is that with all the medical technology and all the all the all the science that we have behind us, when we look at the Spanish flu of 1918, and that's the last time there was a global pandemic of this nature, the mitigation strategies haven't changed. I have these clippings here from newspapers, and I've shared them with the superintendent, uh, and maybe she can send them out to you. I, I don't think it's appropriate to pass this around so we all touch it, but um, the mitigation strategies haven't changed. Uh, face coverings, cleanliness, sanitation, social distancing, and contact tracing. After 100 years, we're still doing the same thing, and it's really the only way uh, to combat this virus. So back at January 20th of this year, the president declared a national state of emergency, and uh, that was 40 some odd weeks ago. Um, as of March 1st, the state of Connecticut Department of Public Health, cooperation with uh, the CDC, began tracking cases. Okay. Um, since the inception of tracking cases, since March 1st, in the town of Cromwell, we have logged um, approximately 200 confirmed positive cases within the town of Cromwell. 50% of those cases, mind you, uh, come from long-term care facilities in town. That's information I can share with you. Okay, uh, It's also information that's available online. So that leaves us about 100 cases as of today. Uh, that come from community spread throughout the community at large. It's people like you and I and our children. Okay? So I want to share with you, though, that out of those 100 cases, nine of them are under the age of 18. Okay? Nine out of 100 are under the age of 18. Coincidentally, the students that attend our, 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 our four schools are under the age of 18 as well. So those are those nine. Out of those nine, two of them do not attend school here in town. So that leaves us seven students under the age of 18 throughout this entire pandemic who have been delivered to me confirmed positive by the State of Connecticut Department of Pu Public Health through its Connecticut Electronic Disease Surveillance System as reported through the CDC, mind you not through any other outlet or any other, any other agency, through the CDC, because those are what we follow, okay? We traced all seven of those cases. Well, actually, we even traced the other two. So we traced nine. We traced them all. Not one of those cases was traced back to a community transmission within our schools, okay? Why is that? I'm sure that's a big question, and, 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 and the underlying theme here is probably a question that you all have. If this pandemic is so dangerous to all, why are we all here? Okay. Why is it that those seven cases were not traced back to community transmission within our schools? It's because of the mitigation efforts that are being put in place the mitigation efforts that are in practice here within our district, the strict adherence to face coverings, the strict adherence to cleanliness and sanitation, and Tommy and his crew, okay, that do deep cleaning, intra cleaning during the day, okay. Our kids, our faculty, and our staff is safe here, okay. 
we're safe here. And that's the, that's the message not only from me, but it's the message from those public health and epidemiological experts that know far more than me and have gone to school a hell of a lot more than me. That's the opinion that comes from them too. That's why you see some of the, that's why you see the information that comes out from the State Department of Education where it sounds a little, they, they're, they're sounding a little more liberal than the state figures in terms of when uh, you're changing from a, 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 a yellow to orange to red, this new color coding schematic that we're, that, that we're using here in the state of, uh, state of Connecticut. Um, we're being encouraged to keep our students and our faculty and staff in school as much as possible, okay? Because it's known, it's proven, not only here in the town of Cromwell, but throughout the entire state of Connecticut and around the country, that the mitigation efforts that are being uh, put in place within school systems are very, very good. Very good. Think about what I said. Think about what I said back to 1918. Face coverings, check, right? Cleanliness and sanitation, Tommy, you get an A. <laughs> All right? Contact tracing, Jillian, Pam, they're scholars. Social distancing, we got it. We got it right here too, okay? Seven out of 100 under the age of 18 in Cromwell, not one due to transmission within the school district. So where's it happening, okay? Where are we seeing it? We're seeing it in the community with gatherings. We're seeing it definitely outside of the school district, but we're seeing it in the community with gatherings where social distancing and face coverings are not being worn or used properly, okay? And we're seeing it in athletics, athletics outside of the school. It's amazing, we're playing girls volleyball, right? We have, we are playing activities. We are doing almost all of our sports and we have not, knock on wood, had one uh, issue. And however, it's a very different story for outside teams outside of the school system. But we're getting, we're getting cases with athletics. Absolutely. Out, uh, athletic leagues outside of the school system. Travel leagues, ice hockey, huge all over the state. State of Massachusetts shut down all the, uh, all the hockey rinks in the state for a period of time. Okay. Um, so I'm confident, I'm confident where we are. I'm confident with our mitigation strategies. Um, when we have situations that come up, for instance, what happened last weekend uh, with Cromwell High School, we take these situations and we look at them from the perspective of what have we learned what can we do better what are the lessons we take away from this and what do we need to strengthen so that not only we work towards further mitigation okay but lessening the impact on our school community on our school family okay we did that and Fran you've done, you've done an exceptional job and I got to commend you for all the work that you're doing um, so may I we, just, sure go ahead I, so um, when we started this and, and I was very dedicated uh, committed and so was the reopening task force to start in a virtual even though we were low and we were in yellow and we could have gone full we didn't know what to expect um, but we were one of the districts that said we're, we're going to get everybody back in person the beginning of October um, because we worked our tail off to make sure that we could um, really follow the mitigation strategies. We were transparent, I've been transparent from day one about the so social distancing component. Um, schools are not made for six feet apart. Uh, they're community-based and we don't wanna pay millions of dollars for them. So uh, you're, you scale down on projects all the time. And so the, the keeping of six feet unless we stay in a hybrid model is impossible. We are able to promise anywhere between approximately four feet 
to six feet. And there, and and that's when, and, and it constantly I do hear this: six feet spread apart. You know, when they're outside walking and taking their mass breaks, they're kids. Um, that's what we expect. We expect from them. They they are children. We remind them very often. Um, another situation is um, that has always been something that that I've been concerned about and I've voiced it and I've been very transparent about that we've talked about it however with all the other mitigation strategies that's why I was concerned when I thought I heard about the mass wearing um, because this is number one um, is the the cleanliness of the building um, we have our team that's working like uh, Sal said Tommy is t unbelievable um, and what we are doing and, and then the extra precautions that we have taken as a school district as far as uh, what we've spent on PPE um, to clean our, and to have our students clean their desks so that, that when they sit down they know they're the ones that cleaned it and it's, and it's clean. Um, it, it, it costs money but it was well worth it. Um, and, the, and the other thing is the cohorting. Um, we are doing our best to cohort. It is very hard to cohort meaning keeping all the same students, the same place all day long. Um, it's manageable, very manageable at the elementary school, just because of the nature of an elementary school. You have one teacher, you go to specials, uh, we know how that works. Recess, they're all, they're not playing with each other, they're playing with their class. Um, at lunch, they sit with their class. Yes, they're in the cafeteria, but they're cohorted by tables. They're not sharing cohorts. Middle school, we, are doing the best that we absolutely can. They travel in teams, so the cohorts are bigger, but they're still cohorted. That doesn't mean that there are not students that have um, special needs and special requirements and spe that they have to leave that cohort. That happens. The high school is incredibly difficult. 50% of, maybe even more of the state, probably 75 in the beginning, started in a hybrid model at the high school, if not more. We did. Many of them have remained in the hybrid model and continue to. Some have um, got out of the hybrid model or are getting out of the hybrid model next week, and they're going to take the chance, just like we did, because we want our students here. Um, I am not placing blame or pointing fingers at anyone, um, and, and I refuse to do that. Like uh, Mr. Neshi said, it's lessons learned, however, to cohort because it's credit bearing. Um, so to cohort students and to know where every student is in the high school at all times, it is very difficult. And to be able to keep them within six feet um, is, is difficult as well. But really the cohorting component, which we found out when we were contact tracing, that it definitely was hard. It seems as if, as if it's easy to the outside person, but unless you work in a school and you see the ins and outs of all day of what goes on between lunch and moving around and going to guidance counselors and um, the activities that they're participating in, even though we've done wonderfully, that doesn't mean that you may not have been um, deemed a close contact and that's what we saw happen and I can let Sal take over um, I wasn't trying to hide anything but I will always try to uh, protect the identity and I, I will say that I slightly um, I'm, I'm so happy with so many people have been so compassionate about everything and then some people um, it, it's it was a little disappointing to see how um, some people push to know who the person is we will never tell you who the person is that person uh, deserves to be remain confidential um, and they have rights and we will make sure we protect those rights but if you, we believe that your child or staff member is deemed a close contact and we know because of the, the the extensive contact tracing you will absolutely be informed by phone <laughs> a personal phone call from from our team so with that being said, I'll yeah. I'll give it back to Mr. Neshi. And, and Dr. Macri, to add what you're saying to add uh, what you're saying to uh, that when we were in a hybrid mode and moved over to uh, a full in-person learning experience full time, the metrics that we were using to make that determination were also different at the time. They were telling us, look, you know, if you're under 10 percent, you're good to go, and we were hovering, you know. Uh, 0.7 percent, 1 percent at the time, if you all recall. There was really no reason for us to keep our, our, our students uh, uh, in, in a hybrid situation. The goal was to bring them into a full-time uh, learning experience 
and the metrics showed that we should be there, that's where we needed to go. Okay, and I'm, it's, and and even now, as much as we can, we should be there as well. Um, but when we look at mitigating uh, the, the mitigating factors that we want to put into place and the strategies we want to want to put into place, sometimes doesn't work out that way, and we have to adjust and learn from where we were and where we want to be, and ultimately, the health and safety of the students and the faculty and staff. Um, why don't I just throw it out there, and if there's any questions or any other comments, or we just want to take questions at this point? Hi, I have a question. Please. Can you talk a little bit about like how far you go back for contact tracing and what defines a direct contact versus an indirect contact? Because I've seen in the last few weeks it being used differently by different towns. Right. So a direct contact, and that's a good question. A direct contact is defined by the CDC as somebody who has come within six feet of a confirmed or presumptive case positive, okay, for 15 minutes, period, regardless of face covering, because that comes up all the time. But we were wearing masks, doesn't matter, okay regardless of face covering, covering, unless that face cover is a medical grade N95 respirator, which none of us uh, have direct access to. Um, so that, that, to answer your question, that's, that is the definition per the CDC of a direct contact, 15 minutes inside of six feet with a confirmed positive or presumptive case. Presumptive case is somebody that's defined as having symptoms and awaiting test results and is currently quarantining themselves until such time they, they, uh, they, they receive the results of their test. How far do we go back when we contact trace? To direct contacts, okay? Do we come in, do we, do we uh, 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 come within communication? Do we have communication with uh, other contacts? What we call contacts of contacts. Okay, so if you're confirmed positive and you've been next to her for 15 minutes inside of six feet, you're then considered a contact, okay? And if I come in contact with you until you're symptomatic, I am only a contact of a contact until you're symptomatic or get tested positive. Contacts of contacts are not required to quarantine, but direct contacts are. Okay. I, Ka yes. Catherine, I'm, do you have a question related to that? Because yes. Okay. Do you mind, Lori? Go ahead, Lori. Uh, I have one related to this, but yeah, I just, I just have okay. You had just mentioned about the six feet for 15 minutes, with mask or without mask, it doesn't matter. Is that inside and outside or just inside? Regardless of environment, indoors and outdoors. It's outdoors too? Yes. Catherine. And, and in the case of the high school positive, the way the contact tracing was done, it, and I understand we're dealing with high school students, it seems a little different, but if I tested positive, for example, the entire room here was quarantined. The entire room. Correct. We did not look for six feet. We did not look at where students may have been sitting. Correct. However, there is a, and if we were able to guarantee this, it would have been different. Right. This is not what our class, and I don't want anyone to think that that is true, and I've made that clear from day one. There's could be one or two people in between, um, each one of us, one at least. Um, if we could guarantee this all day long, and the only way to guarantee this is to be in hybrid, mm -hmm. um, it's the only way we can guarantee it, then it, it would have been different and we can't and because of the different movements of specific people at specific times um and i and i'm this uh and, and i don't it, it's not it's about being protective um and and my some of my conversations make me aware of how protective i have to be because um it's pretty brutal out there and i'm not gonna let anyone go through that um it's not fair to the person um and people have made assumptions and people have tried to guess and some of people have been very wrong 
Um, and it's bad enough when it's an adult, but when you are trying to guess and that uh, a chi if it's a child, to me, everyone is a child. <laughs> they're told they're 18 under my care, um, a student. Um, it's not fair because it could be your child tomorrow. And that has to be respected. Um, and we did our best. We did our absolute best, but we could not guarantee this, nor could we guarantee one with 100%. This is where people are getting a little confused. We could not guarantee with 100% certainty of every single person that may have been in contact. Um, and that it is very easy to happen in a high school. Mm -hmm. And in a middle school too, and in an elementary, but it's just less likely. In looking at that situation, to, and to expand on, on, on the on the answer to your question, in looking at that situation, how do we how do we improve or how do we guarantee that in the next time there is a confirmed positive within the high school community, how do we lessen the impact where we don't have to quarantine 160? I believe it was 140 something, okay. Fran. So how do we do that? Okay, in order to well, do that. That's for uh, student population right. and about 14 staff members. So in order to work that down to a much smaller, more manageable number to quarantine, we have to look at what the overall picture is. And like what Dr. Macri is saying, you want to see this everywhere. And to do that, we needed to decrease the population so that there's less people in the building at any given point so that we can guarantee this social distancing and we can guarantee that you're sitting in that seat all the time every time you show up to a certain class or or or, 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 or a teachers using a or staff is using the same area all the time and guarantee seating identified seating so that when the next time this happens we can lessen the impact and put less people out. But aren't we holding our school at a different standard than we are the rest of the public? Uh, of no, because the rest of the public should be social distancing as well, including bonfires in people's backyards. But even if we're not six feet apart, I mean, even if we're, we're, we're less than six feet apart between Dipti and I, there's another person in here Lori's still six feet from me if I test positive. So if we have assigned seating and go through other protocols with students. But when you're on your, your own, respectfully, when you're on your own and your children are with you and they're under your care, you could do whatever you want. When they're in school, we're the guardians at Lightham. And Mr. Ne I am the superintendent. Mr. Neshi is the health coordinator. And we take our positions and our nursing supervisors very seriously. So it, um, we can't promise, I, and I have made it clear, the social distancing piece is, is very, very, very hard to promise. The attendance piece, uh, I'm sorry, the where you're sitting, we do a heck of a job, which is why we only had nine cases. One is enough to scare us, to make us relook at everything, and to really recalculate and um, look at all last week is that's exactly what misty fiore and her team did um is look at every single solitary possible thing that we could control um which we believed was in our control and then you find out other things as as th certain things to uh, begin to uh, get uncovered is there are students who are involved in a lot of activities and we you want me to I heard loud and clear at the beginning, and I want to too, loud and clear from the community. You want me to have our students engage in activities, and guess what? So do I. However, with that comes a price. When you now decide to quarantine, I have to look at all those activities. We have to look at every single solitary activity, and that's exactly what happened. And yes, we were not comfortable. I wasn't comfortable. At one point, Mr. Ineshi and I had a discussion of, do we quarantine the entire school? Everybody. That was a discussion. Because at one point, it took 36 hours to get to where we were. Whether people want to believe it's because we were prepared or not prepared, 
That's how often, and people who work in schools realize, especially a high school, um, things can change uh, very quickly. And that is, uh, it, it was the perfect storm that none of us really expected. And I believe we were as prepared as we were going to be. Um, but in that situation, we did err on the side of caution, and I do not have one regret no. of erring on the side of caution. No. And, and, and also, uh, please take into consideration, too, relative to that situation, um, no decision is made easily, um, and we have to weigh all the factors uh, that, that we were confronted with. And uh, we went also as far as bringing this to the attention of the State Department of Public Health. Uh, we spoke with the Office of the Chief Epidemiologist with the state um, and ran this whole scenario by them. And uh, we took their guidance and counsel on this as well. And they strongly uh, uh, supported the efforts that we were uh, gonna put in place. That, that, that we move forward with so it, it was a collective uh, it was a collective decision I believe it was the right decision and moving forward I think we've uh, made some uh, 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 significant improvements so that the impact is uh, is lessened the next time this happens and I stress the next time this happens because as much as we're following the rules here in school the community is not period if not, we would not see the transmission rate in this community that we're seeing now. So with the transmission rate, or I have a couple of questions. I know you had one too, Lou, but with the transmission rate, do we have, I know the state breaks down the metrics of what age grouping is getting infected and you told us there were nine that were infected and that's through the whole pandemic since the start of? Since March 1st. Okay, and um, the other piece of it is, is. Are you talking about the age group that's primarily being infected right. since like say? Since, so how many have been infected since we've been in school? In this second wave? Since September 1st, I'm going to read off age groups for you. Okay. 31, 63, 31, 39, 19, 64, 78, 30, 13, 61, 30, 71, 72, 29, 31, oh, 20, uh, 21, 25, 44, 45, 34, 54, 55, 36, 27, 42, 69, 14, 17, 10, 66, 16, 50, uh, 59, 30, 17, 15, 14, 37, 20, 28, 25. So who wants to be the health coordinator or the superintendent during a pandemic? <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> there, it's very difficult to trace all of Or who of wants this. to sit out at that bonfire <laughs> all close together without our masks and say, because we're outside, we're fine. It's the 30s, 40s, 50s, 50-year-olds 50 when you look at those numbers. Yeah. Okay. Catherine, are you all set or can I go to, go to Lou? You can go, Lou. Lou, please. Good evening, Dr. Neshi. Um, no, I'm not a doctor. I just play one Neshi, on TV. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> first of all, thank you. and, and She's uh, the doctor. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you and ladies for all your work, hard work no and dedication. I have a question for you regarding the, um, the, um, the 15 minutes that you uh, discussed uh, briefly. Um, is that one continuous uh, visit, for instance, or can that be determined, or uh, it, could it be a, a, um, a multiple visits that amount to 15 minutes or more? Or does it have so, to be one continuous visit, 15 minutes? I, and I'm glad you brought that question up because that's, Thank you. That's, been, that's been a situation that we've been dealing with for a, for a while. We try to look at it at 15 minutes at one time. Okay, but the CDC uh, has just recently in the last week has told us that it's the, the transmission is very possible over a 24. Uh, so we, we look at uh, like a 24 hour period because I could, 
come within six feet of you just passing you at the grocery store and cough and you're going to and I have the virus and you can pick it up because we know that it's a droplet transmission okay the virus doesn't live very long on hard surfaces and it's very easily killed uh, this is something we talked about today on our call with the State Department of Education and Public Health um, so we're starting to look more at a 15 minute exposure over a 24 hour period versus 15 minutes at a clip very important to us because 15 minutes at a clip with you and I within uh, six feet of each other can spread the virus to each other we know that and and that's what we look at first okay but we also have to look at who are we spending a lot of time with spend five minutes with you now five minutes with you this afternoon we're right up against each other shoulder to shoulder right in the elevator whatever uh and and you know uh, it, it was even uh, determined that just something as quick as giving somebody a hug okay and uh which lasts a couple of seconds that physical contact you're a close contact so if i call you and you tell me you hug somebody they're close contact. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Uh, thank Lori, you, Lou. Lori? Yeah. yeah, I just had a question. So we know that we're doing a good job in the schools, and the problem is out in the community, people not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So I'm just wondering if it comes to someone's attention that, say, Jeff had a party and he we know that there's people at his house and, and he didn't the, invite us right? <laughs> and they weren't wearing masks they, they weren't wearing masks they weren't social distancing and we know this and there's students and the students were there like as a district do we have any right to say you have to you have to stay home or like what are what are the the so there's a couple things you can do if you want to rat out Jeff all right. Not any party. These are your friends. That's the last one here who's having a party. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can call me. Um, like, can you? What would you do at that point? I guess is my question. Would so there's been information that's been put out to the public as to how you should, you know, how to react when you see a violation. This is a it's a COVID violation. Okay, we'll call it a COVID violation. Um, you can call 211. Okay, there's a report line there. You can go on the one of the state websites for the Department of Economic and Community Development (DCD) uh, or DPH, and there's a com uh, online complaint form that you can put put in there. Or you can call the local uh, you can call the local health jurisdiction. You can call my office, and we uh, we investigate every complaint that we get, whether it's in one of the business sectors, one of the economic sectors in town or it's an individual or somebody calls me to tell me that they're uh, they know that their neighbor just flew in from florida and they're not quarantining um i give them a call i find out how to get a hold of them i give them a call and we talk to them and uh, and try to try to uh, uh educate educate we want to educate through enforcement you've heard all this about the uh uh, uh executive orders and fining and giving out tickets and uh, you know uh, 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 we're very big on education you know, enforcement through education okay because that makes you a better smarter more responsible person responsible where you are taking care of yourself and you're making sure that you're taking care of others just like wearing a mask this is showing respect for the people around you thank you um are you all set but you can't force if they say no can they still send their students to school i mean what what are our, what does the district has have as rights like if the if they just clearly ignore i mean can they still send their students to school and risk infecting their peers so you're talking about say if chairman matrulo's <laughs> children yes were at mind. his backyard party yes. and they were not social distancing and not wearing masks should Chairman Matrula's children still continue to go to school, and can we stop them? Yeah. That's a fine line. That's a fine line. Uh, I, I would probably have a, a 
serious talk with Chairman Matrullo about what he does on his off time and how There's it's impacting the rest of the community, and then we would go from there. I thought I was going to take a beating, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to join. No, no problem. But um, the answer, I mean, importantly, is it, that the, yes, the children can come to school. Yeah. Um, we have had people who who have not been honest with us about travel. Um, and, and there's been anonymous letters, and we look oh, into sure. everything. And, and um, quite frankly, there. Um, Those are the easy. There ones. are parties the, happening. Yeah. We know. Yeah. We know that, the, the, and we're notified. And there was one happening while we were notifying people um, about the content. Two. The the situ two happening, yeah. and yeah. and it was you know very uh, difficult for the person who made that phone call and the communication with the parent of what do I do I have all these kids in my house well the, this is the reality and and I you know I think this is an amazing community and the fact that we're doing as as well in school is wonderful is wonderful but we have increased a lot over the last few weeks and we um we we need to do something about it if in-person learning is our priority um and I know Miss Grandy is ready to speak I just <laughs> in listening to everybody I just want to remind people too that you don't have to wait for the school system to do something because a lot of times people call us and would say something about that party but don't hesitate that if Jeff is your friend and you know that it happened speak up now even the other day and I said this to Ms. Cocciola the schools are doing great but we can only do 7:30 to 2:30 or 8:30 to 3:30 and I saw some of our middle school kids walking down Main Street on our half day. And there were groups of 10, groups of 15, probably even a 20 group. And they had no masks, they're all together. Now they're kids, we get that. They've been in their masks all day, but we have to ask you as parents and talk to your friends and their friends and your neighbors to remind people that just because they leave the school doesn't mean they have to leave all the rules, so to speak. So, you know, it, it's hard because when you see things happening, it's hard to speak up. But just remember, you're going to be safer and your kids are going to be safer because we don't want all that coming into the school. But don't think that we can do everything. You see what I'm saying? Thanks. Um, we have to, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. I we, we, there comes a time when we have to weigh the risks at hand. Um, and that depends on the community. Um, last week, and I explained this, you know, when we were going through all of this, and we're calling till 11 o'clock at night. We're up, we're talking, everything. We're up back at 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm at work, 6 or whatever, 5 o'clock. I'm driving home after being all day on a Sunday, which I would like to be home. Um, I have one day off too. I drive by the park where there is an, uh, a, a soccer team that's playing. Um, no one's wearing masks. The coaches weren't wearing masks. They were, they were talking to the kids. They were pulling it down. Um, the people were close to each other. I said, I just killed myself. I'm getting a um, letter <laughs> beat up, and this is happening in our community. I have to turn my head because it is frustrating. We can't do this alone. Our, my number one responsibility is to take care of your kids, to make sure they're safe, and to get them educated. But it's always going to be to make sure they're safe. And so we have to outweigh the, those risks. Um, we have to look at them and we have to make decisions. And I'm always going to err on the side of caution and I don't do it by myself. I do it with Mr. Neshi, uh, Ms. Hansen, Ms. Grandy, and in this situation with the Department of Public Health's um, input as well. So like Sal said, we're in this together, we're gonna get through it together, but how? Um, really depends on how serious uh, we take this. And um, we can't tell you what to do and how to live your life, but when the kids are in school, we, we can. We've been going through this uh, for about eight months now. And yeah, it's it, exhausting. It, it, we're, we're exhausted, we're tired. <laughs> when I say we, all of us, all of us yeah. the whole community, the whole state, the whole country, the world. We call it pandemic fatigue, okay? But at the same time, we're, we're still continuing to build this plane as we fly it, all right? Because there's, 
so everything is so fluid. The, uh, the, the, the guidance that we get, whether it's from the State Department of Public Health or the State Department of Education, the DCD, the CDC, it changes constantly. We were just talking when uh, Lou was asking about the 15 minutes. Up until last week, it was 15 minutes at a clip. Now it's 15 minutes over, over uh, a 24-hour period. Um, you know, it's fluid. Okay, we're building this plane as we fly it. So, Sal, um, just have, sorry, just have a question. And please, you know, a lot of times, people from the public will ask board members, "Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that?" And, you know, the answer part of it is, you know, I'm not the medical expert. Dr. Matthews not the medical expert. So. I just want to ask a couple of questions um, that I've received, and maybe you could help clarify. I'll do my best. Um, as I understand, if a student uh, is a contact of someone with a, who was a positive test, um, the contact is quarantined. But if the, if the contact takes a test and tests negative, as I understand, the per that person still has to quarantine? Yes. Could you just explain the reason for that? That's the, it's the guidance that we've received from the state from health the state. department and the okay. CDC. Okay. So regardless of test, what, and even we'll, we'll go off on a tangent really quick about tests, whether it's a, a rapid test or the uh, or a long-term PCR test, uh, it doesn't matter okay. uh, whether they test or not. That test result is a snapshot in time of that moment right. when you delivered your specimen to uh, 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 for testing for the lab, uh, we're we're advised that you can transmit this virus up to uh, two weeks, you, uh, uh, two uh, two weeks after exposure. Um, so, do we test every day? No, the testing is not required uh, of uh, of a direct contact either. Again, it goes back to the reason being is that the test result is a snapshot of that moment, but you can transmit the virus up to 14 days after. That's why we have a mandatory two-week quarantine, and we don't deviate from that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, did you have other questions, Jeff? Uh, I'm sorry. You well, I'll let others oh. take their turns. So okay. Dipti and then Selena. Talking about the quarantine, I read a couple headlines last week, and not uh, nothing more about that, that the CDC was considering less than two weeks quarantine for school age children have you heard anything about that or no nothing okay no have you guys no the team hasn't heard it okay. selena i just had a question about the hybrid at the high school is that more of a mitigation strategy going forward or is that more to do with contact tracing because it makes it easier to contact trace so that's a, a very difficult question and we um, it's one that I keeps me up every night since this happened it, it did before because I knew it would be difficult with the high school um, we talk uh, we are on the calls with CDC I'm on the calls with superintendents we're looking at the numbers um, I, I would like Mr. Neshi to review the numbers, like how this has changed over time and how you're looking at schools a little bit differently um, than, than the community. Um, when w everyone wants to know, well, how long is this, how long will we be in the hybrid model um, at the high school? So there's a few factors here. One is right now we just had this situation we, this is what we needed to do. In order to come back this week in hybrid, it, it took Ms. DeMauro, two secretaries, the assistant principal at the high school, they made personal calls for two days straight to subs and people. We got people qualified to be subs. We really, we, we forced them to come and sub for us so that we could open our schools. And we are going to, you'll see the price. <laughs> For coverage for teachers as well um, we had to put a coverage plan together and then ask teachers if they would be willing to do the coverage and give up their planning time so most schools uh, without a system of, of what we had going last week it was everyone it was the entire district working um, would not have been able to open this week the reason why we couldn't even think about opening last week was um, we were clean we, we could we did not have the substitutes and in order to open on Thursday and Friday that means another school would have had to close. Um, we, we are clear of subs. 
districts are talking about not getting subs. Ms. DeMauro has brought on more subs during a pandemic than anybody that I've ever met. She knows uh, what to do. How long will we be in hybrid? I do not know as of today. We will continue to talk about it. We have talked very seriously and it's been um, put out by the Department of, the Public, uh, Department of Public Health, other superintendents that have uh, talked about the fact that students from college will be coming home very soon. And we know the interaction because we had certain situations that are of, of this nature that our students are going to be interacting with students that are coming that are coming home from college. Um, they, they have gone as far as having a discussion, which it'll never happen because the state won't really mandate anything, of talk, and talked about going fully virtual. Some districts have made that decision to go fully virtual the week of Thanksgiving and the week before um, the holiday break, the Christmas break, the winter break. Um, we are not there however we are very cognizant and careful that if we bring the high school students back too soon while them being involved in all the activities that they are involved in and we're broaching upon winter athletics um, which kelly can talk about as well um, where do we want our priorities to be and do we want a little bit of everything is something that we have to think about because the, if, if we were to say we're coming to school, no one's participating in any athletics activities, which is not uh, realistic, um, could we get everybody back? Can we do six, six feet social distancing? No. Could we get everybody back? Um, will we end up in the same situation because the numbers are going high again? in the community and we know that our students are going to be exposed. Um, we have to use a little bit of common sense here too. Does that mean we're never going back to full uh, the high school? No, our goal is to get here. However, in order to go put a high school into hybrid, I know Ms. DeFiore is probably dying right now. It is not something that happens overnight. It is a huge task of rearranging schedules Students have to, we have to make, it's credit bearing. I think that's the hardest part for people to understand is we don't have all of the, uh, the teachers, extra teachers floating around. Um, we don't know who's going to get sick. We don't know who we're going to have to quarantine. Um, and putting together a hybrid schedule for a high school is a huge task. It's also inconsistency for our students. If we do hybrid one week and the next week we're coming back full time, it's inconsistent for the kids. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with winter sports. We should hopefully know within the next couple weeks. You just week. Oh, they did? Okay. The, just, that just happened because we had a meeting this morning. Ms. Maher just said they just extended it another week. Mm -hmm. So w the decision for winter sports, which we all know is not going to be, um, we're not going to, uh, those calls will start about basketball and wearing masks and spectators and why won't you let me watch the game and all of that. So um, we have to think carefully and we have to think realistically and we have to um, we have to look at the operations of a school as well and so right now I'm not giving a date because we don't have a date this team has to talk and I would love to hear from the board as well regarding this matter but I think Mr. Neshi and I think it's important to hear from Mr. Neshi and Ms. Hansen and Ms. Grandy um, on this matter and even Ms. DeFiori um, because this is a team effort. It's not as easy as everyone um, thinks that it is. There's a lot to, to think about and, and do. And right now, we're in the hybrid model and we're definitely staying here um, for a couple, at least a, a couple of weeks, uh, if not longer, um, because we're going into the red. We're about to be in the red tomorrow, right, Mr. Neshi? No, uh, don't push it. It's Thursday. Oh, Thursday. Oh, <laughs> tomorrow's Wednesday. I don't even know the day of the week anymore. We'll see. We'll we're see. Very, yeah. We're very close. We're very and we'll, close. And we'll, and we'll talk about that, too. Okay. But just to follow up on the, the, what, you were, what you were saying, Doctor, about the athletics and going into the winter season, um, and I'm sure the CIAC is going to come out again with their positions and all that, we take the lead from the DPH guidance. So when the DPH guidance comes out, we'll talk. We'll discuss it with the team and then we'll make decisions from there because it also not only impacts what happens uh, uh, 
in the scholastic world, but it also impacts what happens with the travel leagues as well because we have jurisdiction over that. I want to uh, talk briefly about this Addendum 4, this infamous uh, updated Addendum 4. You all got a copy of it? Okay. Um, and I just want to read to you a quote from when I received it. Okay. I received it through the State Department of Public Health, um, and I received it from Dr. Lynn Sosa, the Deputy uh, Chief Epidemiologist. And I just want to stress again what I, uh, what, you know, in my opening remarks and, and what she says, this addendum acknowledges that the experience in our state since school reopening began indicates that transmission has been a rare event inside of school buildings. Okay, she's speaking statewide here. Even in communities with elevated transmission rates, like ours, uh, likely due to high level of planning and compliance with mitigation strategies uh, designated to prevent transmission between individuals. Again, that's kudos to all of you, to Tommy, to the principals, to Pam and Jillian, to Dr. Macri, to everybody here. So when you look at addendum four, and it shows that there's guidance here as to where you should look at more in-person learning, reassess, uh, uh, in-person learning to look at more of a hybrid model or less in-person uh, where you're doing more remote teaching, uh, remote learning. It's not clear-cut, okay? It's not clear-cut. You have to look at the whole picture as, where, as to where we stand. Um, but the numbers are more liberal with the schools because of those mitigation efforts. And I think you wanted me to touch on that, Doc. Yes. Okay, and that's yes. the reason. And then why. also the um, changes of the 14-day average. And so, okay. The uh, thank you for keeping me on track. So, I was thinking about going to Chairman Matrullo's house after the meeting. <laughs> You're not going to his house. <laughs> um, so every Thursday, the state will deliver to us our case rate per 100,000 people. Okay, they look at the previous two weeks as reported through the CDC. Okay, the CDC puts out a weekly report uh, of all communicable diseases uh, that, uh, that are prevalent throughout the world, okay, and their case rates and what's going on. So we get our official numbers because there's a lot of numbers that are thrown out there. And you can look at these formulas and you can twist them all sorts of different ways and you can make us look like we have a 2% transmission rate. You can make us look like we have a 102% transmission rate. Okay, we follow one, one set of guidelines from the state. I don't come up with these numbers. I don't come up with the formula. I don't calculate it. Um, I get it from the State Department of Public Health. So October 4th to October 17th, and that two-week period week one we had 11 confirmed positive cases week two we had 16 okay that gave us a three a 13.9 case rate per 100,000 people so when you see we're at 13.9 here in Cromwell okay countywide for that same period we're at 8.5 which is relatively low okay uh, for the county so I don't know, doctor, if you had an opportunity to share this formula. I did, um, but not. You got it, but you probably didn't have a chance to okay. read it. <laughs> so basically, if when you when you see this on your email, I take it, uh, doctor. Yes. Okay. So when you see this on your email, this shows you how that rate is derived. It's quite simple. Just you need to know the exact numbers to plug in. Okay, and you only get those numbers from the CDC. We get them every Thursday at 4 o'clock, and if uh, we're going to change colors, they give us 24-hour warning <laughs> and three more meetings a week. <laughs> Four more, sorry. We got Four the more. naughty letter last week. Yeah. I said, we no! Office hours. We got to go to office hours. <laughs> uh, I feel like, uh, you know. And we're in go. detention. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you take the, uh, you take the, the, the two weeks, you add them together, you come up with a number. So in this, if, I don't know if you have it in front of you, but they give two examples. 
town A, town B. Town A has a population of 70, uh, 7,500, 7,532. Week one, they had six. Week two, they had eight. Total, they had 14. Okay? And then you take that 14 and divide it by two weeks, 14 days. So that, to make, it, make math simple, that comes out to one case per day, right? Okay? You take that, right, that one case per day, divide it by your population, multiply it times 100,000, and you come up with a case rate of 13.3 for this town A. That's basically what they do, okay? That's how we get to this 13.9 that we're at right now, and I think our cap to move to red is 15, so we're dangerously close, dangerously close. Um, today, we had one confirmed positive. Yesterday, I think we had five. Um, but last week, we were getting five, six a day. We are getting quite a few. Um, does that kind of explain to you all? Questions? I, I just want to say uh, thank you. And can we make sure that is in the minutes for everybody yes. to see? Um, yes. I, uh, they sent it to us when we're, we were off the meeting. But I was already in another meeting so that I just forwarded it to all of you just in case you had nothing else to do between 4 and 6 o'clock. <laughs> but I will put it in the minutes. And I, um, we can also put it on our website. Yes. Let's do that. Okay. Well, I think that's the primary reason that um, I'd hope to have uh, Mr. Nesha here today because the revised addendum four came out last week, and you know our numbers were north of 10 per 100,000 residents, and everybody in the pu in the public was saying, "Why are we still full time? Why aren't we transitioning?" So that's why, you know, we asked you, you to be here so you can help explain right. that for everybody to. And understand. that's and we used that per 100,000, and this was also discussed today too on our calls. We used that per 100,000 because it puts us all on the same right. playing field. That way you can take a small town like say Chester and you can compare it to a medium sized town like say Middletown, which then can be compared to a larger city like Hartford or Waterbury or New Britain. Um, and you're all using the same formula. It makes it, 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 makes it more realistic that if you had a hundred thousand people, it would be a, a X percentage of positives per day using this formula. So I appreciate that, and it, and it does. It's confusing to people that don't follow this as closely. When I'm not a I'm not a statistician and, either. When the, when the guidance <laughs> okay. changes and our approach stays the same, people are always wondering why. So. But, but thank you for clarifying. Um, My Jen. inability to do statistics brought me here today. <laughs> thank you. There's a story behind that, but I'll wait to go to your backyard you to go. tell you. <laughs> Jen, please. Yeah, sorry, this is going back to um, when you were talking about the, the faculty and having to get all the subs. And um, I guess I'm just trying to understand for this, the six feet, 15 minutes, if, if a teacher is in the front of the classroom, they have hopefully six feet from a student. So why are so many teachers having to quarantine? Perhaps the teacher is walking around. You have no idea what, how this is killing me being behind a podium. I like to walk around and get right up in front of you. Maybe that, you know? So that is a good question. And we, we talk about that um, with our, we, everyone knows we have a teacher's union. Uh, teacher's unions are, um, very uh, passionate and they're very uh, committed to our students and they're also concerned about their health just like all of us are um, and they didn't know what they were walking into and I have two here <laughs> so you don't know what you're walking into I have a pair of professional hair um, I know we understand uh, in the education profession uh, you know people may consider not some of us that we were fortunate we were able to stay home for a while while everything you know was happening um, and a lot of people worked from home and a, and a lot of people are still working from home um, but that isn't the case um, with educators and they're in contact with many more people at one time however we do have some difference of opinion and they're like uh, Mr. Neshi said it's, it's not clear cut um, in some districts, uh, the teachers' union has made it 
uh, very clear that they want to keep that six feet distance and they're able to um, it, it's very tempting if you're a teacher I had, I don't know if I could make it 10 minutes I taught fourth and fifth grade um, the little ones it's impossible impossible uh, I, I don't think uh, Dipti probably stays within half a foot within some of her students cracked every day um, we have to be respectful and understand that that could happen. It is natural for us to gravitate to each other, and it is very natural for students to gravitate to their teachers just as much as it is. We say, well, tell the teacher to stay away. The, the kids want to be near their teachers as well. They're longing for, for that connection. So um, some districts have had situations where they've had to uh, quarantine and have not had to quarantine the teacher because the teacher was 100% positive that she or he was not near uh, the student who was being quarantined um, or the staff member who was being quarantined. We have other situations where the teacher isn't 100% sure but within 48 hours. If they were, they weren't. Um, because they see so many kids a day and it's so primarily when they're little it's by nature that the kids are not going to stay away from you and then by the time you get to secondary you see so many students a day and there's so many different interactions that you don't always remember if you asked me today I have central office if you asked me today of how long it would be very difficult we do we we try so hard to not be within each other's space. We have Zoom meetings in within our own office because if I'm out, central office is, you know, we're, we're gonna be in trouble. So, and, and if you ask me, I'm constantly, we're constantly saying, okay, it's been 15 minutes, we gotta go, we gotta run, gotta go. Um, because, we're, because we're nervous about uh, that happening. And that's, and we're adults. So you bring in children, students, and I, and I, I, I don't wanna say, uh, you know, I know we have 18 year olds. However, um, they do still need the support of their teachers and they're going to gravitate to their teachers, their coaches, each other. That happens naturally. We could say all day long that it's the school's <coughs> fault or the teacher's fault. We could point fingers all day. But, um, you know, just like we've been sharing, um, this is everyone's, there's responsibility in all of it. And the only way we can guarantee that no one's going anywhere is if we're back where we in March we were in March, and I don't think anybody wants us to be there. We, uh, as a matter of fact, we are what the what the experts are telling us is that we're in a surge, like we were back in the spring, and we're a month and a half at least, two months away from being at the peak of this surge. Could not come at a worse time, folks couldn't come at a worse time we have holidays coming up all right put aside halloween we have thanksgiving christmas new year's we have all the great holidays coming up and it's going to be from a socially distant perspective this is a totally different way of life for us we're not a people who want to be told what to do and that's what it comes down to it fatigue has uh, uh, pandemic fatigue has set in we all want to get out of this right we all want to go to that bonfire in the backyard but we can't do this alone we got to do this together we got to do this together uh -uh. since the inception of this pandemic since they were started keeping records March 1st I gave you that number of approximately 200 confirmed positive cases in town a hundred of which were from the long-term care facilities yada yada in the first phase of this pandemic okay in the first curve remember we had to flatten the curve back in the spring so from March 1st until, say, June, we only had about 40, we only had about 40 cases in the community, 40 to 45 cases in the community at large, okay? That includes, you know, all age groups. The summer was like dead. Weeks would go by, not one positive case. It's like what pandemic, right? September. October, and we're halfway, we're almost through October, just about through with October. So in two months, we've picked up more 
community transmitted cases than we did in the entire spring and summer okay so what I want to tell you what the message I want to leave you with is we need to marshal our efforts okay marshal our efforts to mitigate this virus we're doing a great job in our school district we need to spread the word we need to work with our friends our families our relatives in the community and I charge you all to be ambassadors for public health and help help spread the word help mitigate this virus Thank if you see him throwing a party <laughs> in his backyard you drop a dime on it I'll be all over it. I won't, I won't be mad. Uh, Chairman, you have more questions, please. Uh, not me. I just want to have two more from the uh, board, and then we'll, we'll let you out of here. So, uh, Lou, please. Thank you. Um, I guess the, 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 the ultimate question is, is, it starts off with a statement, is that the high school right now is in a uh, hybrid model until the end of November. Is that correct? I have not given any okay. date at all. all right. we, um, we will continue to talk. Uh, we are looking about uh, we are looking at operational things we're also looking at things such as the holidays are coming right. up um, we're on a day-to-day -day at, at the time we're, we're on a right and week. and and the fact that we do not want to jump from we're, we're in hybrid and then move back to full and then go back to hybrid because right. the inconsistency is just as bad for our students and staff as it is um, uh, for, for other things as well so okay. I'm looking at the big picture I uh, my lens is 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 a little different Understood. than everyone else. I, I guess and then that would lead me to um, maybe to mr. Neshi uh, as, as to the the guidelines or the protocol or the methodology to kind of get back to where we need to be and I'm seeing a, a couple different things is the the, the orange to possibly red numbers um, on one end uh, of the spectrum, right? Or, or one one line and then the other line being uh, the seven cases that is relatively low uh, and with zero transmission within the, you know, uh, it's a community spread as opposed to here in a school. Mm -hmm. How do you take that in consideration? Yes, uh, those uh, are called secondary factors that we look at. That when we look at what what the issues we're dealing with at hand right in front of us and what the transmission rate in the school is and then we look at those secondary factors what's happening in the community are mitigation strategies working are they not working what needs to be improved on how do we get there do we need to decrease the population in a certain sector like the high school so that we can promote social distancing in assigned seating so that we can only we only have to quarantine 20 people versus 120 right. people we look at all that stuff yeah, but I'm, I'm, you know, saying those numbers and then looking at like addendum four that you cited, sure, which look positive. Um, obviously, the orange to red is not a positive thing, but uh, using the the addendum four and using the uh, the the numbers, uh, the seven students seems to be a a positive number. It, it looking at from that that perspective, right? Extremely, right? Extremely. So, uh, how much weight is put on that as opposed to the orange to red scenario in, in making the decisions to bring the, the kids ultimately bring them back which is the goal of everyone here right and where are we how do you weigh all those factors together to come to a decision that is going to be not only good for the students for right. faculty staff parents so and, and, and that's a really good point and I think the underlying concern here if we look at we look at the yellow, yellow the, is the yellow elephant or the pink elephant the yellow white. elephant in the room it's white it's our ESL white elephant the white <laughs> okay. if you look at the white elephant in the room the issue we're concerned with with the high schools not that we had the confirmed cases that we put out 170 people on quarantine right okay and that's what we want that's what we don't want to have happen again we don't want to quarantine so if we if, if if this case had turned out differently in terms of when the transmission happened, when the test took place, when the symptoms, when, when the symptoms of this individual became apparent, it could have resulted in zero people being put out because we look at that 48 hours, okay, 
one of the things that we needed that, that we that we neglected to talk about yeah. with uh, a being point. a close contact is the 48 hour <coughs> excuse me the 48 hour contact going back from the date of symptomology or the date of test okay specimen delivery if if this one particular case in the in, in in the high school community had been on a different day had been uh, you know on a long weekend and when we traced it back to 48 hours the close contacts could have resulted in nothing okay and we've been very lucky knock on wood very lucky with those seven that we i was talking about earlier that that didn't happen in say the middle school or at Woodside or at ECS okay because when you went back to 48 hours individuals had no contact with people in the in the school community so that's why when I talk about how the the, the 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 transmission rate in the school is not a result of uh, what's happening in the school it's a result of what's happening outside the school because when we do that contact tracing and we go back those 48 hours there was no, there was the, 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 there was no contact directly within the school community, okay. So, to answer your question, how do we, you know, what do we use, what, what factors do we use to weigh against a situation that we're dealing with, and what we take into consideration? We take it all into consideration, but when we're presented with a situation where we can't guarantee who a close contact is and who a close contact is not from a public health perspective I get paid to be a pessimist I have to look on the dark side of things and it means if I got to quarantine the entire room I'll quarantine the entire room for the benefit of the entire community you follow what I'm saying so in my opinion 160 or 170 people is better than 550 or 600 people that's the way I got to look at it and that's what I got to stick to okay but I don't make those decisions very lightly. Okay, there's a lot that goes into those decisions, and again, I, I consult with the state epidemiologists who are dealing with this on a regular basis as well. Okay, and I, and, and, and I heed their advice greatly. Thank you. Thank you for your time. No problem. Uh, no problem. Selena. I just wondered. Um, with the information that you're given, do you ever know the number of tests taken, not the positives, but the total number of tests taken? Because I'm just wondering, I mean, I think in the summer, testing probably wasn't being done as much because you go back to school, yeah. you get sent home to quarantine, 175 people go get a test. Yeah. So, so every it's day natural at, that uh, we'll have every, more cases. Every day at four o'clock, mm -hmm. the state numbers come out, okay? It's uh, on, if you go to the State Department of Public Health's website, click on the COVID link right at the top of the screen there's a red banner it brings you to another link that says data tracker it's a little button you click on it and data tracker will tell you how many you know when you hear on the news uh, at right after four o'clock the governor will talk at his press conferences about how many additional positives how many hospitalizations how many deaths all that information comes from data tracker right at four o'clock every single day um, we were just talking earlier before the meeting on uh, data tracker is not updated on the weekends so on Monday uh, yesterday the ga they gave us the numbers for uh, the entire weekend there was over a hundred thousand tests administered just this weekend throughout the state of Connecticut and it was an astonishing number of like what did I say 5,000 something like that a huge number of positives uh, today uh, today alone in the last 24 hours there was over 500 additional positives today just in the state of Connecticut so that information is out there it tells you how many tests were administered and then uh, periodically they tell us they'll, they'll let us know how many tests were administered within the community so and how does that compare to earlier in the summer if you know generally? oh it's huge right now so yeah. we have a lot more testing now than we much did back more then. And, and yes and and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and and to add to, to, to your comment and we and we all know the more testing we do the more positives we're going to get because the majority of the folks out there that contract this virus that carry this virus and test positive are asymptomatic we all know what that means mm -hmm. okay they're asympto uh, asymptomatic okay we could there could be people among us right now in this room we're carrying the virus 
We don't even know it, okay? And then, and and we and, and there's a school of thought out there. Is like, uh, well, it's no big deal. Well, it's no big deal to you or me or whoever because we're healthy adults. But you transmit that virus to somebody who's immunocompromised, okay, or somebody who's elderly, who can't handle this virus. We've seen how many people have died from this virus, okay, and that's why we wear these to respect our neighbors, okay, and in that same sense that we respect our neighbors and wear these face coverings. I ask you to help the ambassadors of public health and spread the word and do your part. Drop a dime. Thank you. Can I add on part two oh, to that? Please. Oh, please. Go Just ahead. To, I know I mentioned to this to you, Dr. Macri, separately, but in anticipation of people gathering despite the warnings for Thanksgiving break and holiday breaks. Um, just something I thought we should talk about. And I know other schools have, have started considering going virtual for the week after a big holiday just to allow for some time and possible you know if you have symptoms you're home and then you stay home and then you don't contaminate the whole school so just something I wondered if we could discuss at some point and giving people enough time to plan for that we we did uh, talk about that on our house our Hartford Association of Superintendents call today some districts have decided to already do that this is so hard um, mm -hmm. there is like again it, We've talked a little bit about it. My main concern is how am I gonna get these kids back? That could possibly help. Um, I, I think of um, our uh, elementary school families and uh, that's a really busy time and I, I worry about the stress of the families who have to then find daycare because they have to work and then everything else that's going on. Um, there's so many things that you wouldn't imagine that goes through this crazy head of mine yeah, no, when I try <laughs> he's right there with me we yeah. talk about it all the time yeah. I don't I don't have the perfect answer I I right now I was I'm thinking no I'm thinking we come to school maybe um Mon I, I'm, I'm thinking of a, a bunch of different scenarios um for the Thanksgiving week mm -hmm. the holiday week uh, I don't want to keep kids out of school but Selena to your point and to the point of the point that Lou made earlier is how many kids do I want to keep out at once how many chances do I want to take how much do I want to risk do I want to stay in hybrid a little longer because then I can guarantee that I'm only if something happens and it's not it's not if it's when and how much are they going to social distance during the time that I have them out of school versus when they're at school when it's already been proven that being in school is right is a safe place. It's a for safe them. place. But you bring up a good point because higher education is doing that all yeah, over. Yeah, they already all over the place. They're telling they're they're telling college students now when you go home for Thanksgiving, you're not coming back until the end of January. Right. You know, and it's not just that Thanksgiving weekend, Selena. You got to think about it's two weeks after, three weeks after. Okay. When did we really start seeing this surge hit us? It wasn't September first or a week after school started or two weeks. It was really most of it all in the last few months, uh, the last few weeks. It really skyrocketed. So to touch again on the high school point, I think it's very important for everyone that's listening. Um, we're we will continue to talk about it. We will continue to to work it through. But the numbers don't look good. Uh, what we are le learning about our students, not all of them because I do believe that it's different and everyone's household, is that they are continuing to get together. We have decided to move forward with activities and stay um, the course with activities for now because the truth of it is, is this is my decision. Do we stop the activities and maybe decrease the chance or increase the chance because then kids are gonna do activities where they're not using their mitigation strategies. So when they're in our care, they're using them for a little longer. So let's keep doing that because I think wagering our bets, that's probably going to be the more positive. People have asked me that. I'm like, if I have to pick, I'm going to pick this because I believe this is the lesser of the evils and we have those discussions all the time. Um, I hate it when she's right. <laughs> we, we do. Um, and I do not feel conf confident or that it is in the best interest of um, anyone, mm -hmm. teachers, staff, everyone, students at the high school right now to say, 
let's put a date on when we're going to cut off the hybrid because I really want to take the chance of seeing, uh, waiting a while and seeing when a case hits, how good we are at then saying we were able to keep out mm -hmm. only this many students yeah. um, and how we were able to contact trace it and how well we were really able to do it and from the from the activities and and, and um that's who's like sleeping saying, over whose house and, and all of that because that's happening too um so that's what we have to be patient and i know people are i have, i probably have you know 50 percent saying okay and the other 50 saying oh my god and i and i know i'll hear from them um, and I don't mind answering the questions, it's, but my, um, you want me to concentrate, you want me to focus on concentrating and figuring out how to get kids back and not responding to the emails. Um, I don't mind. However, I'm responding to emails um, that I've, of things that I've already said and I've said and people have heard and then they ask me again and then I get the same email back with the same questions broken down in a different way. You don't want me to spend my time that way. You want me to spend my time doing the right thing, which is figuring out and problem solving with Mr. Neshi and the team and the administrators um, on how to do this better. Putting a date on when we're going to come out of hybrid at the high school is like putting a date on when the, when yes. the pandemic is gonna end. We can't, it ha it's a day by day thing. It's a fluid thing. Y'all just need to know that you have a team here with Dr. Macri, myself, Pam and Jillian, that are working very very hard very closely together i'm telling you every day and every decision that we make is for uh, we feel is the best decision it's a conservative decision for public health and safety of our school community it might not be the popular decision but you all don't pay our salaries to make people love us you pay our salaries to make good decisions for your community. You need to trust us and support us. And we're going to get through this. Thank you. Um, so very robust discussion, which I'm sure will continue um, you know, next meeting. Uh, is there anything further for Sal? I, I want to be respectful this time. And just sure, <laughs> Catherine, please. So if we know that they're telling us from the Department of Health that Sorry to keep my back to you the whole no, no, time. No, no, it's no problem, very no hard to talk to the microphone. No, in sorry, no sorry. Um, That the indicators of transmission in schools are rare in communities. We've, we've already known that. And they've also said that um, they've given a lot of guidance on this. And they've said that the schools are doing a great job. All those mitigating strategies we've asked you to do, you're doing a great job. We were full time, had all these mitigation strategies, did a great job. So we had a positive case. Okay where are they providing the guidance and they want us to stay in school they've said that they want the students to be in school as much as possible because that's the safest best place for them where are they providing input and guidance and help to towns like ours to keep our kids in school more full-time and less hybrid where's their guidance in helping you figure out how to keep our kids in the classroom together <coughs> You're I just don't understand. You're looking at it, Catherine. Yeah. One, two, three, four. You, you could all say, of our meetings. You could say that it's the, the changes in Addendum 4. You yep. can say that it's the 75-page uh, reentry plan there that, that State wrote. Department of Public Health put out. You could say that it's the uh, reopening plan that this district wrote. Okay? It's a great but plan. But I'm going to tell you this. And I've said this throughout my entire career because I've dealt with a response to emergency crisis situations one after another after another over the years, okay? All response is local. And that's what you have this team for, and we need you to support us. And, okay? and then we are I know it's hard. I know it's hard for everybody to hear. Um, sometimes teams take a while to kind of get used to each other. Uh, Pam and Jillian are unbelievable. The The nice thing is that uh, Sal and I have, Mr. Neshi and I have been through the deaths of children because of situations that have happened in a school district. We've been through the peanut butter craze. We've been through, H1 you N1. name H1N1. Um, we have problem solved and processed for years 
we just ended up both being in Cromwell at the same time during a pandemic, which is serendipitous. I'm just glad serendipitous. to be working with Pam and Jillian. That's all <laughs> right. I'm. Just it has nothing to do. With, it's serendipitous. So um, where some uh, superintendents that I speak to and often – they're very, uh, one superintendent that I talked to last night, she said, my health director makes all the decisions. I don't even get to have a say in any of it. It isn't like that. I do have a say. Um, I push back in one certain situation. I said, that's it. I think I have to do this. No one's listening. I called the D uh, DPH. I called Sal. And he's like, all right, go for it. And, and, uh, and, and on the flip side. We've had those conversations all, all day long. We hear other superintendents on calls with the governor. That they don't even know how to get a hold of the They don't even health know department. how to find their health department. So they're making these decisions on their own. And I I hear some of them and I, I cringe and I feel badly for my colleagues because I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so happy that is not our situation. So, yes, we are asking for community support and community trust. That does not mean you have to agree or like it. That does not mean any of that. I asked last time, and I, I think it's been better with a, a couple situations. People have been very respectful in their emails. Um, I think people are understanding that that's the best way to approach me because that's the way I approach you. Um, this is really hard for everyone. Um, I will answer your questions, and um, I, I think I'm very approachable. However, there, there comes a time where we will end up getting off the phone, and that happened today, is where we respectfully disagreed, and, um, you know, and that's how it'll end. And it's, it's really hard because this is my second year here, and I started my first year off in a pandemic. I didn't even get to know people. But I have to tell you, um, last week I probably had over 10, and I shared a few with some board members, not all board members, uh, from parents who are just have been wonderful they're like we the, and even the person that we disagreed today the last thing that parent said to me was i am so happy that i am not sitting in your seat hmm. he said i wouldn't want to be sitting in your seat and and um that's okay with me like we disagreed we moved on he said that i said thank you very you know thank you very much and um parents some parents have been incredibly uh supportive and have just gone out of their way to send me emails and, and I haven't met them. They just, I'm their superintendent, their child superintendent, and so grateful. Um, and WIS and ECSPTA even sent me flowers. So there, there's a lot of good in my administrators as well. Um, there's a lot that's happening uh, that's good. Uh, it's just sometimes the, the negative gets the louder, you know, the, it gets, makes more noise. But there's a lot of good that is happening here. Um, if, like, for example, Mrs. Uh, Wilson, we had a great conversation, and she she had hard questions for me, and we talked it through, and she, she said, wow, I would have never thought that, and or this or that. And she works in a school. And so it was it's really interesting of how things are happening uh, differently because it is local, um, and we have to be careful about the decisions that we make. And we don't want to jump from one thing to another to another uh, the inconsistencies are not good. And then we don't know what's working and not working. We don't know what the variable is either. So what's the variable? What's, is it because we're keeping people, kids six feet apart and, or, and they're still participating in activities? Or is it because we have this assigned seating chart, but some kids are breaking it and some aren't, and we can actually catch uh, the ones that are breaking it now because there's half the population? It, that's, that's the reality. If we keep changing... Uh, the variables. We're not going to get to the root of what the problem is. So we're going to uh, stay the course for a little bit in hybrid. Um, I don't, I'm not giving a, a date because I don't have one and we're going to keep talking it out. But the goal is for all students to be in in person learning the safest way possible mm -hmm. in Cromwell Public <clears throat> Schools. And, and, I don't want to go backwards. Um, many people have gone six through twelve hybrid as well, and I said no. Right, let's we're, we're hanging in there. There's been a couple of close calls, but we're hanging in there at the middle school. Mm -hmm. um, so let's keep trying with with the effort of the administration um, and the teachers and the parents, uh, and especially our kids. So. Um just to put a bow on it, again, thank you, uh, Mr. Neshi, for coming. <clears throat> Since you kept zinging me in my backyard barbecue, I'll say I don't think I knew of Sal more eight months ago, and our lives are much easier. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> Our lives were much easier eight months ago before this whole thing started. He's a phenomenal so. cook. His wife is a phenomenal cook, so I'm sure he'll invite you over and okay. you can talk. There you go. Learn about your Italian. So uh, <laughs> bring the fire, I'll bring the food. So th thank you so much. We <clears throat> thank appreciate you. your time. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good luck and stay healthy, everybody. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Neshi, Nurse go. Hansen, Nurse Grandy. You're, you're, you're you are dismissed. You <laughs> Thank you. Um, so looking at the time, uh, we, you know, I didn't want to cut that discussion short. Can we, is there anything we have to discuss tonight or can we push? Um, the only thing that we do have to do is um, new business, the school lunch program. Um, the action and I have the form here for us to sign so that we can continue and and um, families we are our students are getting food for free um, even if they want to if it's breakfast or whatever and they want uh, obviously the milk they would have to throw away but if they want to take the meals and put them in their bags and save it for later if some please have your children take the meals it helps the program and because we're getting a high, high reimbursement rate. So please encourage people to take the free lunch and the free breakfast um, because it helps the program and we need the help because remember last year we only got reimbursed 75% for feeding during um, uh, well, school closure. So please encourage that. So that we need that, we need to do that. And then the only other thing is um, we have um, Kate Puro, who, who is our administrator oh, of uh, Cromwell Youth Services. I forgot yeah. she's been on. Yeah, she's time. been on. Oh, and so is Dr. Spino, who is our, uh, high, our high school chemistry teacher. Um, but he, uh, kayak program, he is in it's my participation. I, I, can't even, I, I can't even get to the meeting, um, but I, I read the minutes. Um, kayak is a group of students uh, to increase school and community awareness of tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs provides resources, programs for the prevention of, of um, substance abuse, abuse in Cromwell. Uh, Dr. Spino and Ms. Pirro are incredibly devoted with a group of uh, community members, um, and they have a presentation for us about, an, uh, it's, it's the Search Institute uh, Attitudes and Behaviors Survey. It's an unbelievable survey. We uh, want to give we want to be able to give this survey to our students and we just want to tell you briefly what it's about so that when it comes out you um, don't find out just as a parent but you know as a board first okay. those are the two things and we can save the rest for later okay so can we do the uh, presentation now sure if they're still awake Is it both of them together? they're together Kate, hi there we hear you First, uh, sorry for keeping you um, so long, um, but we appreciate your patience. That's all right. Um, I don't know if Dr. Spino is with us still. I, I am here. Okay, cool. Um, well, so then, Henry, do you just want to start and introduce um, CPAC? So CPAC is our uh, Cromwell Prevention and Awareness Council. It is a local prevention council um, that um, Kate and I are in charge of. And um, we do receive um, some grant money from the state to promote awareness about substance abuse. And um, this year we, we are focusing on vaping. Um, that was a state initiative for that prevention awareness. But we also realized um, more holistically that we want to um, conduct a survey. And uh, we've done this several years ago, and I think Kate's gonna take over because she can speak a lot more intelligently than I can. <laughs> so um, I'm Kate, thank you for having me um, virtually tonight. I'm the Youth Services Administrator for the Town of Cromwell. And like Dr. Spino said, I sit on CPAC, um, Cromwell's Local Prevention Council. Um, but also as administrator of youth services, I'm really interested in promoting positive development for youth and their families, um, empowering them to make healthy decisions, strengthening them, um, and supporting their resiliency. Um, and so we create kind of like a network of services um, and collaborations within the community to meet those goals. Um, and 
since I've started in Cromwell almost two years ago, I've given particular emphasis to social emotional well being and mental health. And so you can see how everything starts to come together between um, my goals as administrator, but then also my service on CPAC with Dr. Spino and our other community stakeholders. Um, and so back in December 2013, um, this is before I was with uh, youth services here in Cromwell, CPAC did implement administer the search institute survey uh, for attitudes and behaviors for all students grades seven through 12. Um, and be that data um, isn't relevant anymore. Those students have all graduated, they're gone. Um, so we do feel that it's time to um, do this survey again, to get a snapshot of our students' social, emotional well-being, um, their mental health, the strengths and supports that they have in place in their lives, um, and really to give voice to the students themselves um, about what are kind of their thriving indicators and their risk behaviors um, in order to help youth services, CPAC, and Cromwell schools um, with strategic planning around curriculum and social emotional learning and different initiatives and programming that we all put out individually or together um, collaboratively. And so the survey takes students about 30 minutes to complete. We'd like to once again survey all students in grades seven through 12. It's 160 questions um, and they really focus on the 40 developmental assets, um, which are broken down into external assets. So the things happening around children in their immediate environment um, that either propel them towards positive outcomes or put them at risk for negative ones. And then those internal assets, um, which are you know, the innate skills um, that each child possesses um, that again, propels them towards positive outcomes or puts them at risk for negative outcomes. Um, and so what happens is when the, the survey is electronic um, and we would be asking for passive consent um, from, from parents to do it. So informing parents of the survey um, and the, giving them the opportunity to opt out. Additionally, any student who's going to take the survey can opt out themselves if they decide not to complete it or they don't want to answer particular questions in the survey. They do have that independent option as well. Um, but the survey data in the end, I, we want it to be available to inform our strategic planning, but also for schools to use. Um, I've had different individuals within the schools reach out looking for data to support the work that they're doing on social emotional learning or health class curriculums or looking at school climate and macro initiatives. Um, and we just don't have that data now. Um, and the reason why we wanna come together and do this um, is because we do have an opportunity right now through various um, grant funding sources and my own department to uh, pay for the survey um, and for, for all of us to benefit from the data. It's aggregate data, so it protects students' rights to confidentiality. There's no identifying information used. We can't pinpoint who answered what. It's all aggregate. Um, a survey, a copy of the survey would be available at Town Hall in the Youth Services Office. Any parent wants to view it beforehand, um, able to make it available electronically just because they don't have anybody stealing the survey. Um, but I would have it available well in advance for parents to review if they were on the fence about whether or not to let their child partake in the survey. Um, but there's a lot of benefits to be had, especially, I mean, right now during the COVID pandemic, I know it's the bulk of everyone's attention right now, but to get a snapshot for how these kids are doing and what we can, what supports, initiatives, resources we can put in place um, to help them work towards better outcomes and to empower them. I just think it's um, really pivotal. Um, and 
it's a main goal of ours to get it done. And so we wanted to come to you um, and make ourselves available for any questions you might have, any comments. Um, we're here to work collaboratively as a team um, in the interest of our Cromwell youth. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? Catherine, please. So we're gonna, we would administer it to our students in school or yeah. virtually wherever they are, <laughs> through yeah. the school? Yeah. We will administer through the school. Um, the data that, uh, in my past life, <laughs> the data that you get is so rich from this survey yeah. because it really talks about how valued the student, they're pretty honest, how valued they feel, not just from each other, but from us, from the community. Um, and then uh, a lot of risky, you know, at risk behaviors that they tell us about that we could, we could plan and, and provide support. And uh, Kate or uh, Dr. Spino, I don't know if you want to capitalize on what I just said, or, um, but it would be provided through the school, which is why I do want the board to um, vote on this because um, it will reveal information about our community, our students, um, and you and I would like for you to you know to just have to know that. A couple, couple, couple sure. questions. That I'll ask yeah, it, um, it, we do. You yield better responses, a better response rate when you're able to administer the survey during the school day in school. So we would work with, of course, Dr. Macri in central office in both the middle school and the high school um, to plan for that, um, for when might be the ideal time. Off the top of our heads, we know that there's the focus block um, at the middle school and then uh, connections at the high school. But again, we're flexible about making it work um, again, just in like partnership and teamwork with each other, what makes the most sense. But we definitely want that good response rate. So the goal is to administer it while they're in school. Is, is, I'm sorry if you had mentioned this, but is it anonymous? Well, I'm just going to ask all, all three questions. Yeah. Is it anonymous? Can we, yes. see, can we see a copy before we vote on it? And also, um, do who gets the results of the survey? Um, well, the first answer is yes, it's anonymous. Can you see a copy before you vote on it? Um, we wanted you to vote on it now because we wanted to give it, um, so that's up to you. And the third question, um, the, it is shared, uh, Dr. Spino and Ms. Pirro will share it at the Board of Education here at the meeting. They'll present the data to all of us. Um, and we share it at community forums. Um, Kate will use it in her work. Uh, Dr. Sweet, we will all use it in our work for our health classes. So it's not a survey where um, we're not hiding anything. Um, we, if we have a problem, our kids need our help, we're going to give it to them. So um, it'll be shared. Uh, it, it, it could be put up on our website. There's, there's no hiding it, um, which is why it's really nice to use this fully vetted um, survey because it is so uh, highly research-based and we get really good data from it. And I don't know if I missed anything, Dr. Spino or Ms. Pirro. You got it, you got it all. So, so Kate, our next meeting is in two weeks. Um, is it, when do you plan on administering the survey or can we see it at our next meeting? Does that delay you significantly? Um, so we would definitely, you know, I think the fear is that um, or not really the fear, but a uh, big possibility is that um, people go back to distance learning or hybrid schedules. Um, and so the concern is when students are home and we ask them to take this survey, we just don't get the same response rate. Um, and so doing it as soon as possible while kids are actually in the building will yield better responses. Um, but of course, I want to work with you to do what makes the most sense. I do feel a certain urgency. We were going to approach you all back in March. <laughs> um, and of course, COVID shut everything down last March. So this has been kind of on our agenda, uh, one of our goals for a long time to do. Um, and I do worry about delaying and how it jeopardizes the opportunity. Okay. 
I could just add that um, uh, Lisa Hicks should have shared, this is Dr. Spino, sorry, <laughs> um, uh, a link to the survey uh, with the Board of Ed. I don't think that was I, I, mean, I, I just shared that with her today, so I don't know if you have that link. Yeah, so you can see the website oh, and they, they explain the developmental assets and the, the attitudes and behavior survey. So a board member said website. it was emailed out today, but I did not have a chance to look at it. So, um, it, it is, uh, and so there is uh, on that website, there is um, sample questions from the survey. We can't get like the full survey in advance until we buy into doing it. I do have the executive summary and the in-depth profile um, from when it was done back in December 2013. So I do have access to all the questions, but not in a way where I can like release it via email or anything to anyone. Um, to make the purchase, um, just from memory, I'm just making, uh, um, I do, I remember focusing a lot on how the students feel that, how valued do the students feel by the community that we really care about them or is it really about our agenda? That question stuck out to me. Uh, I'll never forget it because it was, it was so sad when you saw the rates. Um, how, how often uh, are students vaping? Are they engaging, um, are they uh, smoking marijuana or other type of drugs? How often are, do they know if their friends are? Um, other risky behaviors, um, alcohol, uh, do they feel that they're being supported in school as far as getting help if they need it? These are, these are just the questions that I remember off the top of my head. But there's, uh, the, the survey does change slightly because you don't really know exactly what it's going to be until you, until you um, make the purchase. And I, don't, I believe what Kate is trying to say is we're not making the purchase until we know we can give it. Is that correct, Kate? Yeah, yeah, it is pretty <laughs> expensive. expensive. So. Okay, uh, question from Lou. Uh, I, for one, would like to have a chance to read the email and look, look at that, at least some of the sample questions. Um, I would propose that maybe, if it's possible, to do, um, do a special Zoom meeting in a few days or next week, um, if, that, if, gives us, it give, if it gives us that time to then have a chance to look at it and then do a quick meeting for a quick vote. We can table it till then. Um, I'll give everybody a chance to review it. I know for one, I didn't get a chance today at work to, I came right from work, I, I was late. So I, didn't, I personally didn't have a chance to look at it and I like to before I vote on it. Do others feel similarly? I agree. Okay, so if people are okay with that, um, We'll table it then. I think we should just do it. Uh, sorry, John? Let's just do it. Perfect. Right, well, if there's a motion, then does somebody want to make a motion? John, do you want to make a motion or somebody? I'll, I move we go ahead and go forward with this. Okay. So there's a motion on the floor to vote uh, to approve the um, implementation of the Institute of Attitudes and Behavior Survey. Is there a second? Second. Second by Jen. Comments, questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Opposed by Lori. Uh, abstentions? One abstention. Okay, so the motion carries with one abstention and one um, opposition. Thank so, you. Thank Kate. you, Kate. And, um, Dr. Spino, Ms. Pirro, um, we'll work together uh, to, to, to get the survey out and to our families um, and to uh, our students. Thank you for all the work that you do with Kayak. It does not go unnoticed. Uh, we are very grateful for your, for your work. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Kate. Right. Um, so, okay, so this is the... Which, which it's items? um if you go to oh, the uh, action it's item new, a business, a new business action yes a e, e, new so business. do you want to explain sure this is very quick and ann burke if you're still here and i'm wrong um this is we have to fill out uh, we we need an authorized signatures changed form for our food um 
agreement for our child nutrition program. Oh um, and it used to be Michael Camilleri. It's now Selena Kelleher. <laughs> And, right here, but. and then we need to sign. <laughs> yeah. So there's a motion on the He floor passed it on to you, Selena. <laughs> from John to <laughs> motion from John. Is there a second? Second, second by Lori. Comments, questions. Yeah. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. So is there a motion to table all other agenda items? Motion, motion from oh. Dipti. Second from Lori. Comments, questions. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? None. Motion carries unanimously. Board reports? Uh, none. Topics for future agenda? We'll just move the yep. move them down. Uh, comments, updates, announcements from board members and administrators? Catherine, we'll start with you. Oh, I usually don't. Uh, no, I just thank, thank everyone for their continued ridiculous hours that they're working for our district. We greatly appreciate it. Amen. Um, I'd just like to say that um, we were one of the quarantine families last couple weeks and um, the instruction my son received was just incredible. Um, he was kept occupied the entire day, entire school hours. That was just, it was just incredible to see the level of instruction Great. that he got. It was very happy. Jen, Selena, by me. Just Mecca. thank you to everyone and, and to this board. Um, we need to really work together. I need your support uh, so badly. We all do um, to get through this. Um, so I really do appreciate you. That doesn't mean you can't ask questions. That's your job. Um, but I, I really do appreciate your support. It, it's This is not easy. Lori? Lindsay? Lou? Administrators? Great. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion by John, second by Lou. Comments, questions? All in favor? Adjourn at uh, 9.35. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, John. Signing off, all right?